Hello everyone and welcome. Make a cup of your favorite drink and get comfortable because this is a wonderful time for new stories from Yellow Cat. Send your own stories in the comments below and maybe they'll be in our new video. Today we have new amazing stories so subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed yet and let's get started. Have you ever made the decision to leave your job in the middle of a shift? For what reason if so? I was in a car accident earlier this week, and when I finally get to work, I'm still sore and in a lot of pain. What do I say to my partner who's going to be in the lab that night if we could switch? I tell her why. She says no and that she has to do her homework. She also says that she paid a lot of money for those classes, setting I worked overnight in a hospital lab as a plebotomist and a person who took blood samples. I told her that was fine, so let's switch places halfway through. She said all right. Halfway there, I send her a message through her hospital system. I can see that she's opened and read it, but she doesn't answer. I go back down to the lab, even though I'm still hurting from drawing blood from patients on the floors. When I finally get back into the lab, I see her sitting at the reception desk with her feet up and her tablet open. She's not doing anything. I confronted her and asked, hey, it's halfway through, could we please switch? I'd like to take a break, I'm in a lot of pain. She said, no, I'm sorry, I'm very busy with my homework, you'll have to go back up. I called her out and told her, I can hear you watching a show while doing nothing. Would you switch with me so I can relax for a while? I finally told her enough is enough because we kept arguing, I didn't say anything. I got my hoodie and backpack from the locker room and didn't say anything to anyone before leaving. Not even a hint that I was leaving. Didn't make a big deal out of it, I just left. That made my pain worse during the busiest shift I'd ever had. I left around 2.30am and the morning draws were supposed to begin around 3am to get ahead. I quit my job, clocked out, and went home without saying a word. When my boss calls me in the morning to ask what happened, I tell him. He tells me that you should have called me. When I called him three times, he put me on hold three rings into the last call. I told him I was done working there and with her. I told him she was the reason few people wanted to work overnight and no one would stay. When a new person was being trained, she would make things hard for them and they would quit. Years later, I learned that she left the hospital to go to the newer little brother hospital. While she was there, she was caught making out with someone during the night shift in one of the surgery wards by security guards who were walking the floors. Of course, she was fired right away. It's also important to note that my boss was another reason I quit. That's not very important though. Edit, this happened three years ago. Sorry I made it sound like I'm the begging this happened literally earlier this year. If you accidentally quit, does that count? I had moved after moving out after college in 2002. It was the same old crap that no experience, no job, no job, no experience. I really wanted to get a job in IT. That's why I got a job in the repair shop at Micro Center. I thought we would be working on Microsoft desktops. Instead, I'm getting things like broken laser printers and replacing logic boards and screens in the Emacs and iMacs even though I'd never worked on or even used a Mac before. They didn't care about your expertise, they just gave whatever was in stock to the next person in line. If you didn't know what it was, they'd point you to a PDF to help you figure it out. I worked full time on a family farm until I was 12 years old. While I was in college, I had a few factory jobs, but this was the job I hated the most. After about two months, I was stuck with this desktop that had been hit by lightning. I told them over and over that it couldn't be fixed, but the jerk customer wouldn't listen and the cowardly manager, whose name I think was Michael, wasn't brave enough to say it was impossible to fix. They kept complaining about how long it was taking, so I kept doing what I could. What did they want me to do? It smelled like burnt electronics on the inside. This little jerk of an assistant manager would sneak up behind equipment shelves and listen in on conversations. He was even worse than Michael. One day, I was really mad when Michael was complaining about that PC and saying, God, I hate this place. Man, I want to quit. I was upset and thought I was alone, but I didn't know Weasel, not his real name, but it fits him, was on the other side of the shelves. He heard me and ran straight to Michael. After about 10 minutes, I'm called into the office where Michael, Weasel, and the HR person are waiting for me. 
No plans to leave, but when the HR person asked me about what I said, I said, you know what, yes, I do want to leave. I hate this job. There was no doubt that it was hard at times. I was so weak that I got a job at Blockbuster. Yes, I'm that old. <laughs> it took me three months to get a real IT job. It was worth it, though. Going back to work there would have been worse for me than going back to the farm and building hog pens. I was a cashier at Goodwill, but I also had to stock shelves unless I was working the main register. Since I was the only one who enjoyed it, I was usually positioned as the main. Other people would only come up in the event that there was a long line or when we were closing and attempting to get everyone out as soon as possible. About a month ago, a new store manager began working here. Very quickly afterward, she began causing issues for the staff. She was harsh when it came to clocking in, firing good workers for arriving at work and immediately putting their belongings away rather than walking to the floor, which took less than 30 seconds. She was also impolite to pricers, a slow closer, a lazy opener, and she didn't even arrive on time for her own shifts. She didn't know how operations even worked up there, so she was firing at least 10 employees a month and replacing them with floor staff that I had to train. Not to mention, attempting to function well as a team when nobody knew one another and everything was on my shoulders. In any case, I was okay with this for about three months. After I finished putting my belongings away, she brought up the clocking in thing and I said, fine, whatever, I'll do that, not a huge deal. I've been doing it since she brought it up. A few months later, she pulls me aside and tells me I'm gonna get in trouble for being late. I told her that when I started working here about five months prior to her, I had informed the other managers that the scheduling wasn't working for me at the time and they had graciously excused my tardiness. I had given them two weeks notice as that was when shifts were scheduled to be posted. She wrote me up for it even though she claimed it didn't matter to her. I was furious. I signed off, took the slip, went to the registers, and informed my co-workers that I was going to leave. She agreed with my choice, and after getting my things, I left ten minutes later. Have the members of your HOA or any of your neighbors ever done anything absolutely outrageous? My first home was part of an HOA. I didn't really know what it meant to buy a house in a homeowners association because I was naive. As it happens, the sour old hag on the other side of the street was actually the president or head or whatever lucrative title they gave themselves. She would frequently nag me about trash cans in my storm door which had fallen off during a strong windstorm, so I eventually found out when she proudly declared she was the president and could issue citations. Alright, Karen. But why, my lord, does a homeowners association make it so hard to buy and sell a home? The primary reason I was selling was a special assessment that required the siding and roof to be replaced. Because there wasn't enough money to pay the assessment and the homeowners association wasn't disclosing their financial information, I surmised that the association was pilfering money. All I have is my intuition. I have no proof at all. I didn't have to pay the assessment because my closing date fell before it was finished. The buyer was responsible for that. But the HOA was trying to be tough, saying I had to pay the assessment in full before closing, or the buyer had to. Nobody received the option to pay in full or on a monthly basis, which was provided to all others. They can't determine the total cost until the work is finished, so I knew it was BS. I was given an estimate of roughly $25,000 when the assessment was first announced, but when I tried to close, they came back with an estimate of $35,000. It's clear that the buyer's afraid, as they almost back out of the deal. Fortunately, they eventually back off, and my realtor and I fire back, saying this is all BS and presenting them with the paperwork they sent me for the assessment. I moved out after the sale was finalized and promised myself I would never live in a homeowner's association again. We were informed by two of our new neighbors shortly after we moved into our house that the lot line between our houses had been moved by the neighbor next door. That information was brought to our attention by our neighbors, in the gloom when there was no one else in the house. In a polite manner, I inquired about this matter with the line mover, and he immediately became hostile. Approximately one year later, the same individual pulls something similar with his neighbor on the opposite side of the street who happens to be our friends. 
As a result of the fact that my wife and I are friends with the individual in question, the line mover loses his temper with us as well, again, and makes an attempt to reclaim an easement that was grandfathered in for the top of our driveway. In the end, he just parks his car in the entrance to our driveway after painting a fluorescent orange line across our driveway, telling us that we're not allowed to park beyond the line, and then parking his car there. Naturally, he's in the wrong, and the police have called. If you believe that everyone in your neighborhood is an a-hole and you're normal, then it's possible that you're the a-hole and they're normal. I tell him and his girlfriend, who's just as annoying, that this is something that you should consider. I mean, chances are. Subsequently, they relocated. My dad had this happen to him in the same neighborhood where I grew up. We were always really good friends with this one family in our neighborhood. Their daughter watched me and my sister during the summer for almost five years, and their really smart son taught me algebra while he was studying to be an engineer. Since we have about five acres of land, we let the dad of the family, let's call him John, hunt there. Two years ago, during 2020, the road in our private neighborhood needed some repairs. Not a big deal, every road needs repairs now and then. The main question at the HOA meeting was whether we should just fix the bad parts of the road or tear it up and start over. They had enough money to fix the trouble spots, but not the whole road. Each family had to pay $3,000 to have the whole road torn up and paved over. Remember that this happened in 2020, when almost everyone in the world was worried about their future finances because they didn't know if they'd lose their jobs or not. John called an asphalt company and told everyone at the meeting that it was impossible to fix just a few bad spots on the road. The only way to fix it was to tear it all up and lay new asphalt. A lot of people didn't like hearing it, but because he met with the asphalt company, everyone believed him except my dad. He called three other companies and asked them to look at our road. He told us that fixing the whole road would be a waste of money and that we should just fix the bad spots. There was a meeting after this one and my dad brought it up. He made John look like a fool. He looked down at my dad the whole time while smoke was almost coming out of his ears. When he talked to my dad after the meeting, who he was always nice to and treated like a friend, he lost it. He went from being an adult to a toddler who screamed and cursed at my dad. That person was so angry that he had never seen anyone so angry before, and the fact that it was over our road confused him. My dad didn't lose his cool, but he looked stupid. We didn't have to pay $3,000 to vote earlier this year. Everyone did it on the road. Most people in the neighborhood now hate this guy because he lied to everyone and almost cost every family $3,000. It's not me, it's my parents. Following approximately seven years of residing in our house, my parents made the decision to purchase an in-ground pool. I lived in a middle-class suburbia where everything revolved around trying to outdo your neighbors. As a result, nobody in my neighborhood was happy about the pool, especially our neighbors to the right. All of the lots in the neighborhood, with the exception of ours, were unable to have a pool due to a variety of logistical issues. Our neighbors, you see, would not even allow their children to play on the grass. They were the most pretentious people when it came to matters of this nature, and as a result, they had filled the board of director of the homeowner association with themselves and their friends many years ago. In spite of the fact that it did not really serve any purpose, the HOA had made the decision many years ago to hold a potluck picnic for the community on an annual basis. They'd also become more elaborate with each passing year. A DJ was present one year, a DJ and a bounce house are present the following year, and so on and so forth. In the future, this will be relevant. As a matter of fact, we have this pool and our neighbors to the right are not happy about it. The Homeowners Association, HOA, files a lawsuit against us alleging that we illegally installed the fence for the pool on the property of our neighbor. It was approximately 10 feet away from their property and there was a row of trees between the fence and the property line that had been there for years without causing any problems. As a result, I'm still perplexed as to where they believe they were going with the lawsuit. As a long story short, we filed a countersuit and emerged victorious. In a strange turn of events, the annual picnics were discontinued, and even after 15 years, they have not been revived. After taking into account the money that was awarded to us, as well as the legal fees, it appears that they're still unable to afford it. Guys, thank you for all the support and likes. Subscribe to the channel if you're not subscribed yet. See you next time.